whenever you guys are ready, can you talk through what you put together? Sure. So yeah, my name is Max. I'm Harris. And for our final project, we implemented the standard map or the Chirikov standard map on the DE1 SOC. So the standard map is a uh, map that's part of uh, chaos theory uh, to describe things like Halley's Comet, uh, the chaos properties of pendulums, uh, and it's an uh, area preserving map. So for every input point into the system, you generate a unique output point. Uh, and as you iterate them, you generate these things that look like orbits. Uh, the quick thing to note about the system is that it is modular 2 pi. So you can imagine that an orbit, uh, the screens are bounded. So just like a uh, sphere, you go up the top, you get the bottom, or from the sides, you end up with the sides. Um, yes, so it's given by these two discrete time equations here. Um, P is for momentum and X is for position. So if you were to look at the, the map on the VGA screen there, you'll see the x-axis corresponds to position, the y-axis corresponds to momentum. The theory behind it, or the idea behind it, is that you've got a pendulum swinging at some um, some period that's kind of irrelevant, but the idea is you apply some impulse to the pendulum at some periodic interval. Once again, this is not a time-dependent system, so time is not a factor. Um, and so when the pendulum is perfectly vertical, the impulse has the greatest effect when the pendulum is horizontal, the impulse has no effect. Um, so that's where you introduce these uh, chaotic orbits. Okay. And depending on the system, you have this K factor, also known as the chaos factor. Uh, so some system might get better described by something very low, like 0 .0, 0 0.01, uh, going up to some really, really high chaos systems where you might have something 500 or greater. Right. So for our first demo here on the screen, we've got, I think, K set to 0 0.5. I'll right click to clear the screen and then I can draw orbits on the screen here. You can see that some orbits go across the screen, so that's an example of a fully periodic orbit. Sometimes you see these smaller orbits over on the middle there, and so that corresponds to a pendulum that's just circling around the bottom. Okay. So for each of these lines, we're generating about a thousand different iterations. So we're going from n equals one all the way up to n equals a thousand, where the initial input to the system is where we click on the VGA display. Uh, that is about 480 pixels by 480 pixels. Uh, and then we scale that down to our system. So we scale that to two pi. Uh, we probably that as an input. Uh, and then for every output that's generated, each iteration, we scale that back up to 480 and display that point. Uh, it's important to note that you're not actually generating the consecutive points along there. Uh, you're generating another one that's however much longer. Uh, so you'll be generating something there, then there, then there, then there, then there. Uh, but as you generate a set, uh, a whole lot of points, it will generate something that looks like a smooth curve or a smooth orbit uh, that is your system, and it should be connected for low values of K. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we run our second demo, which is the same thing, but automated and for increasing values of K. So you can see when you have K equals zero, no impulse, just straight lines across, and then you'll see these nonlinear effects. And ultimately what we'll find is that for very large values of K, um, there's not a deterministic orbit for the pendulum. It's more so a space in which the pendulum may lie at any point in time. So that's where we introduce that uh, chaos. So am I correct that for this sequence of images, it's the the same set of starting points for every image, and that what is changing is K in that equation there? Yes. Okay. And so right now we have it such that for each orbit, we have the same color. It's a deterministic color with respect to position, and that allows us to generate this really smooth curve. Um, we've got a GIF somewhere, and we'll throw that on our website. Neat. Uh, 0.05. So right now we're getting back over to point 0.5, which we had before. Okay. So right now we're at, yeah, a K of point 0.5. Um, at right around K equals point 0.97, the theory is well beyond us, but what happens is there's no perfect orbit that lies across the entire width of the screen. Okay. So you'll see that all of the orbits that are horizontal fall apart. Yeah, that's really advanced dynamical systems theory. Okay. So how do you choose the color? Um, it's it's like some linear function of x and y for the input point. Mm -hmm. Oh, so now we're getting some interesting kind of speckly mm -hmm. patterns. So you watch the orbits start to fall apart in some of the regions. 
Uh, so you can now kind of see that they're not being like those consecutive patterns. They are kind of getting mapped to various points of the screen. Yeah, sure. So now you get something that looks like maybe some sort of spatial phenomenon or an asteroid field or a belt that's around that. But you see that in there's certain regions, like in the bottom, the center, uh, you'll get, you'll still have these orbits while they're still stable. All right, so those are the last fully horizontal orbits and, and the next one should fall apart. So this is at K1. Okay. Now you really notice it. Falling wow. Apart. Yeah, it's honestly, it's really cool to look at. You know, just mesmerizing. And then structures also begin to change. So the middle ones will start to shrink, uh, and then you get this like trilobe thing starting to appear that, what do you like to call it? Oh, fidget spinner. <laughs> 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 and and the, the cool feature about the fact that we're taking the modulus 2 pi is that you can really perform any kind of shift or transpose on this standard map. And so if you were to look at this thing online, you'll see that the fidget spinner, that, as we call it, that's uh -huh. appearing at the top and bottom, you can actually move that to the center. Sure. And then as we move away from that area observing property, as we increase the chaos vector, you'll notice that some of the orbits will begin to overlap. Okay. So when you are in the area observing regime, so those low K values, uh, and you do have it at every point on a unique one, now you'll have stuff that really does overlap. And we should also mention that while there are black pixels on the screen here, if we were to let our iterator run for as long as possible for an infinite number of cycles, we wouldn't see any more black pixels. All of that space would be taken up. Really interesting. So as you move in, oh. the just one more quick question: yeah. the the arithmetic required to generate these is that being that's being performed on the FPGA, correct? Yes. Yes. So we've set up a state machine to first solve for p at the new time step, then perform a lot modulus. So for example, if you have a really large k, um, you'll have to subtract two pi from that many number mm -hmm. of times. So we have a, a looping state there and then solve for x at the next time step. Okay. And because we can put the system in the form that we can solve for pn plus 1 and then reuse that in the end calculation to pipeline that once more. Sure. Okay. Because expanded, this would be a function of both the previous terms, but this pipeline lets us generate them with one less modulo step. Or the step here doesn't require a full modulo, it will only require keeping the value, adding 2 pi, or subtracting 2 pi to get it back into that step. But this first one will require, since k could be a very large factor, plus or minus one, uh, times plus or minus one for the sign. Uh, this could be like 0.5 plus 1,000. Yeah, uh, okay. So it does inherently become more and more complex uh, and longer to solve because we are doing a modulus with fixed point values. Okay, cool. We should also, yeah, we should mention that we're doing our arithmetic in 10.17 fixed point format. 10.17. So that allows us to, if we wanted to uh, do this math in parallel, we're maximizing the number of bits for, what is it? I think it's like two multipliers per DSP block. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very and then, nice. Yeah, the 10.74 also allows us to go up to two to the nine as our maximum K value. So that should be 512 as our maximum K we can support. Yes. Yeah. All right, why don't we move to our last sure. part of the demo here. Oh, let me select. A new SOF. Oh no, okay. That was good. <laughs> what am I missing here? Oh, don't want to reset it. There we go. All right. Uh, so now we're going to take uh, advantage of the chaotic part. Uh -huh. As you notice, the increase, as we increased K, uh, the orbit tend to fall apart, and you got your input points were mapped into those very random output points. So our color that was assigned to blue, you notice that our blue speckle is all over. Uh, so we're taking advantage that this system is also invertible, so that for any point uh, at any given time, you can apply the inverse transformation of the system. So just by solving for everything backwards, you can now calculate the x minus one time steps from only, as only a function of the previous time steps. So in this case, just the same math, we do this, we have a single plus or minus two pi, and then we'll have to perform the p calculation with a full modulo. So that could be an arbitrary number of pi's to make sure, because if we have a very large k, uh, we'll have to subtract or add a lot of times. Um, 
but now we're using that so we can now encrypt our image with a certain K factor and also select the number of time steps we want to iterate over. Uh, and then from that, we can generate an image that is our encrypted image. So just like how RSA, where you have a key pair, um, you can encrypt it with that key pair and then decrypt it. And hopefully that only that will create a matching output. Uh, if you try and apply a different key pair, so a different chaos factor or a different number of time steps that you've iterated over, you should also still have a random decryption as a result. Sure. Yeah. So on the left, we'll keep the original image and then we'll encrypt on the right, just with a simple push button. So there's uh, our first encrypted image. That's with K equals 0 0.5 and with one iteration. Okay. And you'll see that there are spots where um, you lose a little bit. So that's, you can see those diagonal black lines. And that just corresponds to the fact that when you perform this operation and then you convert back to a 320 by 320 image, uh, some of the same output points will be matched to the same pixel. Okay, there's a rounding step that happens in there. But if you have an extremely large picture, when you do your uh, scaling back from 2 pi to 320, you should hopefully have a much better mapping. Yeah. But in our case, we're going to assume that there will be some data loss. And getting something close to the original picture, like being able to see Bruce's face in the end, uh, is going to be a good indicator that our program is functional. Sure. And so here's the decrypted photo. Oh, there it is. <laughs> cool. So you can notice that for the most part, everything was shifted back into its original form. Uh, you do have some artifacts uh, in this region, and then you have this sinusoidal across the main diagonal. Um, but you can tell that it is basically uh, Bruce in the end. Yeah. And those artifacts are a consequence of your, res your the resolution that yeah. your uh, fixed point allows for. Is that correct? Yes. We saw a similar artifact in our Python script. Not just to, not to this extent, but uh -huh. the same kind of thing. It's more of an artifact of the size of the picture, the 320. Uh, since we have implemented uh, a very large sign table for that, for our sign lookup uh, and the arithmetic. Uh, as you increase K, you might run to an issue where your fixed point having only 17 bits of precision would be an issue, but right now we know the main issue is due to truncating back to 320 intervals. Okay, yes. okay, sure. Because uh, you'll have stuff like 320.3 and 320.6 that will get rounded down. Yeah. We've tried okay. different rounding schemas, uh, like doing an easy plus 0.5 and then taking out the integer bits, uh, it doesn't seem to kind of affect it. <laughs> the artifacts are interesting. But if we apply multiple encryptions and then decryptions, you'll notice that you can you can tell he's there, but you'll start to get a lot of noise <laughs> as all those black pixels uh, or all those pixels that put in the wrong spot get mapped over on top of Bruce. Right. So we can also pick uh, different values. Yeah, so let's say I encrypt with a K of 5. Yeah, so you can see there's a lot more, what would you call that, wishy-washy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then back. Yeah. Neat. And so, then the theory behind it is that if you increase K an arbitrarily amount, it should look completely random. So if you just pick on a really large K. Oh, okay. Oh. This is too big. That. It's, it's basically unintelligible. Yes. Um, for, sure. That's only one iteration. If we keep on iterating, that's, yes, you have a complete garbage data. If any person that can see this picture yeah. will not be able to really interpret it. Yeah. I will say that at this point, it's so chaotic that even if you try to decrypt, you're not even going to. It's going to be a mess. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. if we decrypt it. Yeah. Oh, let's, oh. let's, let's uh, try again. Let's go up by one and back by one. Yeah. Sure. But in theory, it's decryptable. Yes. Yeah. So we, we read some papers where they do this again and uh, do, do, do. Google Docs is really happy. But you can tell that just like how we had that warping is the first iteration as you go from one, I think this is four and this is like 12. Yeah. Uh, that it does become inherently garbage data. Uh, and it's really shown by the gray scale of this picture that there's nothing you could tell. Yes. So yeah. any any picture would be completely unintelligible as opposed to this picture of Bruce. Uh, because we kind of know what the colors are, uh, you can kind of tell what's going on in this picture. Yeah. Uh, but grayscale really centers the point that there's no, you can't tell what's in there. Yes, yeah. So as opposed to other cryptographic algorithms that usually operate on the data with ANSI, like a JPEG, or like the whole art of steganography, where you're hiding 
data between the pixels or in the least significant bits of pixels, these uh, operations operate on the pure pixel colors and map points to other points as opposed to operating on a bit stream. Yeah. Uh, like something with RSA would block, bring into blocks, do a bunch of XORs, uh, and then bring them back out into discrete points. Really cool. Really, really cool. And then just the last thing I want to show here is that we've encrypted with k equals 5, and we're going to try to decrypt with k equals 1. And so we can't get back and to the same it doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. And it doesn't work. <laughs> so it's not an interesting not working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so to, to decrypt, you must know the k value and the n value that mm -hmm. was used to encrypt. Yeah. And if you don't have those two, you just get nonsense back. Yeah. Right. Very so cool. just like how for RSA relies on having extremely large prime values, uh, using this for a very secure cryptographic method, you'd want an extremely large K and an extremely large N. So it's a really hard brute force, uh, and there's not something that you could do or some algorithm you can employ to make it more efficient. Yeah, that's really cool. Awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you.